Thank you, Mohit and Dhanashree. Really delighted to be here for the next 30 minutes with a really awesome panel of experts and thought leaders in their respective space. The topic that we are discussing today is building talent and skills for coding the new India. There's no doubt that India is the tech capital of the world and fueling this leadership is our brain power and human talent. The sector is not only generating huge employment, but is also adding thousands of successful entrepreneurs every single day. It's no wonder that the share of digital technology investments into India will be 60% in 2025 from just 10% what it was, was in 2014. So while we have a robust and flourishing tech sector, but our assets could be our biggest risk as well. A recent study reports that 63% Indian companies have shortage of talent primarily in IT and engineering services. We have seen many tech companies moving or starting to set up centers in other countries as well. And at this point, I want to turn to our experts for their thoughts. I, I welcome all of you, but I, my, my first question uh, to, to, is to Amit Ranjan, um, who co-founded SlideShare in 20, 2006, uh, was its COO till it was acquired by LinkedIn. And later Amit joined Government's Digital India program and has been architecting some of the very impactful programs like DigiLocker, having huge impacts of millions of citizens. Welcome it. You know, Thank you. Amit, you, were, you wear multiple hats. You have founded companies, you are uh, uh, creating products, investing in a lot of companies right now that I know. Uh, so what are your thoughts about the talent demand and supply gap that we have? Uh, and what are you guiding startups to navigate this gap? Right, right. So, you know, uh, uh, the whole uh, issue or problem of hiring uh, the right people for your organization, whether it is a startup, whether it is a government or whether it is a large corporation, uh, that uh, tends to have tremendous mind share in terms of, uh, you know, your dairy operational activities. And uh, it kind of assumes uh, even more importance uh, in case of startups. And I remember way back, uh, you know, in my early days of SlideShare, one of the lessons that I learned was that uh, startup founders are nothing but glorified recruiters, right? I mean, so 50% of the job of any founder is just uh, making sure that uh, you can get the right uh, talent into your organization and you can train them and you can actually work with them. So. Uh, my uh, advice always to startups or to, you know, young companies is to kind of, you know, whenever you are thinking about recruitment, whenever you are thinking about people, whenever you are thinking about talent, I think it is instructive to kind of broaden the horizon a little bit and not just think in terms of the recruitment or the hiring function, but to broaden it and to think of it as, as the people function, right? Uh, you know, Henry Ford uh, had this this uh, great saying uh, almost 100 years back when he said that the most important asset in any organization is its people. And it is so surprising that the people do not show up on the balance sheet. Right. So if you go by that saying that the people is the people function, the people, you know, asset is what really determines the the, the future of any organization. And so you got to think of the, the talent problem as essentially a people problem, right? What you're trying to do is not just hire people, not just kind of, you know, get them into the organization. But what you're trying to do is to build the right culture. The culture that you have in your organization should kind of become like the talent magnet in the ecosystem that you are in. There'll be people who will be working in your organization. They'll be leaving the organization. They'll be going out. They'll be talking about it. You know, social media is great at amplifying some of these experiences and messages. People talk about their experiences on social media platforms, they write blogs, they post it, they tell their friends. So what you really want is to kind of, at the, at the, at the foundational level, focus on building the right culture in the organization so that the people who you attract, who you hire, essentially kind of amplify the message around uh, about your company in the external world. And that in turn kind of builds, you know, some kind of a magnetic force in attracting the best people into the company. So once you do that, 
that is when you know you will be successful in getting a steady stream of the best people who will say hey i want to actually come and work in this organization because it's not just a one time problem right recruitment is not just you know getting people one shot or at one time and then you know kind of moving ahead recruitment is a constant thing there will be people who will be coming people would leave you need to replenish them as the organization grows you'll see that startups essentially outgrow themselves you know startups from start from a zero base they go to one then they go to five then they go to 10 50 100 at every stage of the journey you know you are essentially reliving and rebuilding the organization you will need different kinds of skill sets you will need different kinds of people so the key thing here and the message that i want to kind of leave the audience with is that don't think of the talent or the recruitment function just at the hiring at the or at the recruitment level think of it at a broader people level think in terms that what does it take to build the right culture and the culture that you build in your organization the culture that you inculcate kind of should become like the magnet of attracting the best people towards towards your organization and once you know you have a channel of those people coming in then obviously you need to kind of you know set up the right uh, systems and processes so that you can actually hire them and then you can retain them and motivate them towards a long and a fulfilling career wonderful wonderful i think that that was really really insight, insightful and thank you thank you for your thoughts uh, you know before going to the second question uh, i'm sure all of us have heard about aicte uh, i have been personally involved with this institution for the last 15 years Uh, and i must say today aict is completely transformed it's one of the most dynamic regulatory bodies in our country uh, i have seen the council members or and everybody really open to partner with every stakeholder uh, they want to imbibe and share the best practices and most importantly you know they are creating the impact that we need for empowering one of the largest education sector in the world and truly uh, the person who is subtly driving all this goodness and change is here with us today uh, really honored to have you dr buddha chandrashekar my heartiest welcome to you uh, sir you know uh, i think we have talked a lot and uh, we often see these reports about the 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 talent gap that we have uh, in our country so what is and i i know that government is taking this agenda very very seriously so if you could you know spend some light on on your thoughts on on what actions government is taking uh, at their level to really bridge this gap yeah thank you uh, dheeraj and all github team members i'm really delighted to be here as you know under make in india initiative and perform incentive skills india has received more than 375 billion us dollars as an investments in last 8 years which means that india is going to be a global manufacturing hub but empowering the 7 crore higher education students and recent graduates to access the industry aligned courses and skilling and upskilling is a key for atmanirbhar bharat so this continuous upskilling process is going to be a driving driving force for making india the global digital talent hub so interestingly if you see the recent skill india skill reports 1989 2019 and 20 it states one very important uh, interesting ingredient saying that only 46% of the students are found to be employable i think you know we need to we must accept that the old uh, uh, national education policy is more towards creating a worker than an innovator researcher or a startup or an entrepreneur that's the reason we have very few entrepreneurs and you know the startup culture is not grown because that's the way the old education policy was defined but now the new education policy with the help of this new national education policy 2020 under the guidance of honorable minister dharmendra pradhan ji we are transforming the school level to a college level and a universities into a technology and skill powerhouses by implementing interactive digital platforms because till now the old education policy used to assume that every student is same and used to deliver the content the similar content in a similar format to all the students so as you know every student is unique in nature so for them the the way they learn is different 
So what we did on the National Education Policy 2020, we started customizing, adopting and personalizing the educational system so that the student will adopt the content whichever he likes. Let's say I'm pretty good in learning through videos. So I will get the content more on the video side. And if, if you are pretty much interested on the research side, then you will get more research oriented material so that your understanding level on the subject will, uh, you know, will increase. And another main ingredient is the for the national education policy 2020 is it has more focus on the skill based education. And we want to eliminate or reduce the gap between the industry requirements and, uh, and the academia. Because till now what is happening, the student comes out of the knowledge. I mean, out of the college with the knowledge and without any practical experience of the industry. So he don't have any communication skills. He don't have a professional skills. He don't have a practical approach. He don't know what is happening in the industry. So the minute he jumps into the industry, you know, he's not fitting into the industry uh, requirements. So now from the eighth standard onwards, we started implementing the vocational courses. We started doing more hands-on training. We are doing a cross specialization, which is very, very important. And we are doing a mentoring sessions. We are giving more employable based opportunities like internship opportunities where the student works with more than three to four industries slash MNCs, you know, when they are in college. And once he comes out of the college, you know, if he wants to, he's interested, then he can do an apprenticeship opportunity where he can work with an industry. So we are doing all this, you know, various initiatives in order to empower our students. And our intention is very, very simple. We want to give only the best of the best to the students, faculty, as well as to the uh, industry. As we see that is using under Make in India process, we are getting investments not only on IT, BPM and KPOs, because you know that is where our strongest area, but now we are getting investments on auto components, automobiles, aviation, biotechnology, chemicals, food processing, leather, media, railways, roads and highways, renewable energy. I mean, what it really means is our opportunities for our students are huge. So that's where we have taken a pledge that the, we will give, we will prepare all our young minds for future. So we have identified 30 technologies, you know, which can rule the world for next 15 to 20 years. So from uh, artificial intelligence to IoT to blockchain to uh, big data, automation, robotics, you know, immersive AR, VR media, cloud computing, uh, you know, I'm just naming few health technologies, wireless technologies, touch technologies, quantum computing, etc., edge, edge computing, and you know, working on new sensor-based proximity, location-based. So we have identified such 30 technologies and started skilling and upskilling our students so that they are going to be industry ready. So these are the couple of initiatives. The beauty of the entire new education policy is that you know we have understood the requirements of the industry and fine tuning our educational policies using the advanced technologies in order to skill and upskill our students and faculty for their better future. So this is the way we are transforming because you know until till date we are teaching. But now we want to transform. Till now we are giving an education. We want to empower. You know, we want to lead the entire thing using five pillars of national education policy, which call as access, quality, equity, affordability, and accountability. So what happens is this will create the best of the best capacity building, the human resources, you know, the entire globe wants. So that is where we are focusing. And uh, this is the way we are fulfilling the requirement. And I'm sure now recently, if you see a couple of companies started uh, using our internships as well as apprenticeship platforms. And I'm happy to share that in last one and a half year, we are able to give more than 18 lakh internship opportunities. And few of them got recruited with various MNCs and big organizations for a better package. And few even got opportunities in abroad. So we are so happy that this model is working and this model is outcome based. See, now we have moved from a rote methodology to outcome based. We strongly feel that this outcome based approach of national education policy will definitely take our country to a greater heights. Absolutely, sir. And thank you. Thank you so much for that information. In fact, I have personally seen the impact on students of the internship program that we're finding. 
uh, it's phenomenal. I think that's what is really going to bridge the the gap that we call about between the academy and industry. So thank you uh, very much. Our next panelist is someone uh, whom I have been watching from several years. Uh, he is the CEO of India's biggest developer community company, uh, having a community of over one lakh developers and tech enthusiasts. Rohit, Sar Rohit Sardana from Reskill. Um, Rohit, I, I recently came across a report which mentioned uh, about 260 million jobs will be replaced or augmented technology. Uh, and this indicates a huge need for upskilling and reskilling talent, something what Dr. Buddha was just mentioning. What are you hearing from your customers, especially on the corporate side or startups or MNCs? Uh, what are their requirements? What are they asking you to do? Thank you, Dheeraj, for, for this opportunity. Uh, we've been tech company, we're working with startups for a while now, and all of us have has this need of skilling, reskilling, upskilling their existing workforce. And that's something that's that's good for the ecosystem per se, because uh, if I were to uh, put myself in other shoes, hiring, as Amit also said, is a, is a problem for us. And then retaining also is a problem for us, uh, the size and scale of various startups. So there is a lot of emphasis over $70 million being pumped by Amazon to skill their 10,000 workforces and so on and so forth. So large companies are have already started scaling, reskilling their, their existing workforces. Startups are also now slowly but gradually catching up. So we see a lot of these uh, hackathons and knowledge sessions being organized by large unicorn startups currently to engage with existing workforce, add knowledge to them, uh, add a layer of, of learning technology to them changing their their uh, their uh, the, the field of or domain of work inside their organization helping them acquire more skills as part of the same organization and so on and so forth so um, amazing work is being done uh, at the at the back of of supported by AICT at the at the college level but but the change or the movement or the or the or the ball has started rolling in terms of people putting in a lot of emphasis on skilling and reskilling as part of any organization and as part of uh, um, retaining and, and training the existing workforce. Got it, got it, got it, perfect. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to you and, uh, you know, uh, something that me individually, I think I'm sure all of all of the Indians are really proud about, which is the innovation happening in India, especially in the government space. Uh, we talk about Aadhaar, we talk about UPI, we talk about uh, DigiLocker, Coven, so many. And, you know, uh, whenever I go and talk to my colleagues and friends outside India about uh, the impact of UPI or the safe, safety and security I have because I have uh, an app really, you know, uh, enabling contract tracing during COVID, uh, really, you know, has my head up high. You have been involved in many of those personally, and you have built some of them uh, on your own. Uh, we obviously want to see a lot of more innovation coming out of India, which impacts the billion, you know, billions of people in the country and outside the country also. Uh, what is going to be your guidance to our young audience here on how do we build such kind of project, uh, products and platforms? Right, right. So I think you are absolutely, you know, bang on when you say that uh, India has really been at the forefront of building the citizen centric, modern age, new age, technology oriented platforms that have a direct impact on, you know, on governance systems. Um, and whether it is, you know, Aadhaar or it is UPI or it is Coven or it is DigiLocker. Or, and there is a whole lot of others as well. And I've been fortunate, fortunate enough to, you know, to have been positioned in the Ministry of IT where I was directly involved with, uh, you know, DigiLocker and the others I have kind of, you know, had the opportunity to see and experience from very close quarters. And, uh, you know, going back to the point that, uh, you know, we are discussing here and Rohit talked about in terms of reskilling and the kind of new uh, skill sets that you would require in this new age. I think the same applies to the government as well. Uh, one of my, uh, you know, one of the things that I experienced when I started working in the government way back in 2015 is that uh, the government is, you know, an entity which over the years, it obviously runs the, the, the entire country. 
And uh, the way it has been doing that, one of the ways at least it's been doing that is become really good at managing projects, right? But there is a little bit of a relearning or a reskilling that might be required in this situation because a lot of these technology platforms actually require you to actually unlearn a bit of what you do in project management and to kind of think in terms of products and platforms, right? And that is something which might be a little bit of a new thing uh, that, you know, people inside the government would need to imbibe. And so, you know, my role essentially when I joined the government has been kind of the biggest role, if you ask me. So we've obviously, you know, kind of built these technology platforms. We've taken them to the citizens. They are now running uh, and, you know, uh, addressing customer pay, uh, citizen pain points every day. But if you ask me what has been my biggest contribution or the thing that I've actually tried to orchestrate and fight the government, it is actually to help the government understand the value and the importance of building these products and these platforms and to kind of try to bring about a little bit of a change or a rethink or a reskilling in terms of what they are best at because they're coming from a very strong project management background and now they have to kind of you know acquire these skills and actually learn these new things and and, and run and build these platforms and these products. So a couple of things come to my mind, which have been, you know, very, very useful here. One is that, you know, you got to start thinking about India's problems for, from first principles, right? I mean, I had, uh, as part of SlideShare, I had the opportunity to build a globally, a global scale product, uh, you know, which was initially targeted at the the power users of Silicon Valley. But once I came and started working in the government of India, while I learned a lot of things from that experience, I also had to kind of, you know, while I was borrowing some of the best practices, but I had to put on a very India-specific ad, an Indian way of thinking. And that is very important. And that's something, that's a phenomenon that plays out in different, uh, you know, in different uh, ways is that India needs solutions which are very India-centric. You might borrow ideas, you might get inspired by what others are doing across the world, but you got to kind of, you know, take those ideas and then implement it in a very Indian specific way. So thinking from first principles, you know, thinking about what kind of solutions India needs from grounds up. I think the Aadhaar ecosystem, one of the really powerful things that it has done to the country is that it's made people realize the, the value of the API architecture and the API systems. Aadhaar was always built up as an API, right? Which meant that it kind of solves the digital identity problem. And once it does that, it also kind of, you know, enables other products and services to kind of be built on top of it, be it UPI or, you know, DigiLocker and eSign and there's a host of other services. So the, the API architecture and the API way of building products and services is something which is kind of started getting re deeply ingrained inside the government. And that, to my mind, has been one of the absolutely fantastic developments where, you know, because government systems traditionally tend to be built as, you know, standalone and they are siloed. So once you kind of, you know, get them to actually talk to each other using APIs and that, you know, that change can be really transformational. That's right. And and I so much agree with you, Amit. In fact, uh, I've been interviewing a lot of candidates in the recent past. And whenever there's a candidate who has a government experience or has worked with the government or has seen the kind of work happening there, uh, they talk with a lot of pride and passion. Uh, so I think uh, I think all of us as citizens of India have a lot to contribute back and a lot to benefit out of the innovation happening there. So uh, I think students who are on on listening to us, I think there's, there's something uh, in for all of you. So I'll, I'll come back to you, Dr. Buddha. Uh, and I think all of us, many of us have discussed this challenge that technology specifically changes, you know, people say that technology changes with a blink of, of an eye. Um, how easy or difficult it is to keep the education ecosystem in pace with those changes? Um, because that's what we always complain that, you know, uh, what we do in real life and what we are being taught, uh, there is a huge difference. Um, what what challenges do you see as a as, as a regulator, as the administrator? Yeah, I mean, I myself is a technologist, so I'm very much interested uh, to answer them. 
because when i work for various companies in us and various other countries what i realized is our country is more transactional based and technology changed the way we interact and reflect on ways we use technology in communication collaboration and critical thinking and to formulate a creative solution also i mean see the way we have used technology to distribute the covid vaccinations to every who can corner of this country you know that's a beauty of a jugaad you know of what indians can do see none of the country is able to do that you know that is the best example which we can project to the entire globe so coming back to the national education policy 2020 you know we are enabled the national education policy with uh, advanced technologies and it is agile in nature so we basically works in a very scrum model you know smaller life cycle projects so that you know we can accommodate the change much faster because the change management is a critical for any project so so as a technologies pro- come uh, come project manager i understand that uh, you know implementing projects within time and you know in faster phases is very very important with advanced technologies like example now we are coming up with ndr uh, h you know the high for the higher education we are digitizing the entire higher education but using a enterprise architecture which is open uh, agile in nature and we are creating open api based methods because as you know india 2.0 architecture has a uh, open apis exposed for the critical infrastructure so we are utilizing that and we are remodeling and connecting all the educational digital entities with it example uh, there is a concept called abc you know the academic bank of credit so we, there we are using the application of uh, of uh, you know of the of the various uh, existing aadhar based authentication we are using digi locker etc so it's a, the uh, i would like to say that the way we strategized the entire higher education as well as the school education sector is to more aligned towards the existing processes and the technologies in place at the same time you know we are uh, creating a two way o apis so that we can not only consume the data from the other side we can give the data so that they can utilize so the thought process is just to replicate the model what we on the nha so in nhc what they did they have created a health id and you know from there they are just trying to uh, control i mean you know flow the information digital information from a patient to a doctor to all the entire health network right in a similar fashion here we are going to create a student id and that student id as well as institute id and uh, and the infrastructure id of the institute all these three together are going to work and and uh, transfer the information from one place to another place with help of these open apis and uh, and enterprise architecture so this is the way we strategized it and i i completely understand and um, and you know and the the kind of a reengineering of our economics and societies are happening with help of this digitization and technologies so we are keeping that in mind and we are adopting all the new technologies example we even went to a digital twinning so recently we did one experiment from the one of the german based company they have the physical machine in germany we have taken a digital twin of it and we have given it to more than 600 to 700 students of various colleges they worked on that digital twin they tweaked the models and they created best of the best models out of it and which we produced the outcome solution back to the german based company so we, we are you know trying to use all the advanced technologies like ar vr you know digital twinning and trying to give the best to our uh, uh, students as well as faculty i mean we are not only concentrating on students we are even try, you know focusing on faculty we are giving them more uh, advanced technologies faculty development programs so that they can disseminate uh, you know the bet- best knowledge to the students and at the same time as you know government initiatives like uh, software technology park you know export oriented units the special economic zones and recently we opened up the foreign direct investment also so example in the budget if you see right we have said you know the any one any foreign entity can have a investment in the form of center of excellence or a startup within the institutes or universities itself so we are opened up and you know and lots of uh, 
uh, universities from various other countries they are interested to establish their uh, their entities within our college itself so i'm imagining kind of a college park or a stanford model you know where the, you have the companies residing within your institute or university so that the stu- student on the morning session goes to the college and afternoon session he will work for the company so that by the time he comes out you know we want him to get empowerment on the both the sides you know one on the degree he has and the second side you know he has a practical knowledge of working with three to four companies and i completely understand and agree because you know i myself was a software developer even yesterday night till late night i'm writing code so as india is a land of a software developers you know it is an estimated that around 4 to 5 million developers are there in india so i have 4 to 5 million brothers and sisters so i you know and it is ranked third after china and us and i'm sure very soon uh, you know we will even cross china and us because the kind of a movement what i see the kind of encouragement we are doing and the kind of a pattern our students are following you know they are very much interested on web 3.0 and they are working aggressively and they are trying out and we are giving the platforms this is where i see that uh, github comes into picture and i would like to thank to github for giving this amazing opportunity to our students which i you know i know this is not um, any promotional activity but i would like to share my personal experience uh, with all of you because i see that um, you know there is lots of projection saying that we are going to have more than 30 billion uh, yearly revenue in indian software product industry by 2025 you know by nascom etc but but i i see this in a different way you know india is aiming to become a global supplier for software digital technology solutions period so this is where the github comes into picture and recently i had an interaction and my honorable minister ji spoke about you know why don't you teach a b c d e f g to higher education students i said sir they already know because you know they studied about a b c d in school they said no 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 i'm talking about a means artificial intelligence b means blockchain c means cyber security d means data analytics and intelligence e means electronics f means faster coding maybe you know in his in his words maybe faster coding it means no code uh, you know approach and g is github you know so this is where we see the github is very very important for our national education policy because it is a hosting provider platform which is giving a opportunity to all our students and faculty to control and manage their projects by utilizing the version of version controlling and collaboration because working individual is different and working together is different they all are working together see which was lagging in old education policy so we are utilizing the github platform and we are asking them to work together as a community because i see github as a very immensely powerful community i think and it's a open source platform you know this is where we are utilizing i mean you know we see the way the minister of education is working now it is only as i said it wants to give only the best of the best to the students and the faculty we are encouraging them saying that you know you go on github try utilizing this platforms you know now we have a very powerful student community but that student community resides on github and we are so happy and i i was recently reading the numbers i was amazed to see that the kind of a community you have is more than 73 million and with 4 million organizations i mean what a beautiful platform it is and this is where our students are gaining insights you know they are learning they are doing coding and they are using a uh, student offerings which you have given in a real time experience and there is lots of various development tools which you have given for free of cost i would like to thank all github and github partners for it i mean i'm not doing any kind of a pr here but i'm sharing my experience recently i visited a couple of colleges there when i interacted with them you know on the center of excellence groups we have created in various uh, places for innovation and research i'm so happy to see that they all are using this github uh, something called uh, campus you know you have a campus you know where uh, global campus uh, i don't exactly remember the name i think it's a global campus there the students teachers you know and they are utilizing the tools to g- generate the next generation softwares 
and it's a blazing fast you know i really love the way uh, it, it is so fast as to the night we are pulling the code from other developer i was amazing with the kind of uh, fastness it has showed and the code spaces as a collaborative environment the last but not least you know i'm just going on and on but the security you know what you have because i see sometimes what happens you know we will just write some secret or you know some kind of a secure code unsecurely on github and push it and what the beauty thing of github is it automatically detects and deactivates all the secrets committed to the repos you know this is a beautiful thing you know why i don't know who invented this but the kind of a contribution they are doing to the society to the to the software society is is just infinite and the project coordination is last thing because you know as a project manager i need to uh, manage so i sometimes you know manage this using all the tasks is using this uh, you know management tool which you have so last but not least i see that you know we are a very large in number indian developers are a major players in the software ecosystem and then i see that we the future belongs to india with a share, great share of work from different parts of the world i see that indians are going to get settled in various places as of now you know when i used to work for microsoft and various other organizations i see 30% are indians you know on the software side but now i envision in a different way i see that 30 to 40% experts on the automobile industry on the oil and gas industry on the teaching side i think you know these all are possible because we have opened up the doors and the national education policy is fully concentrating on innovation on the startup ecosystem and i'm so happy to see that more than 7.5 lakh startups and they are very well working and working together as a team and trying to do something you know which is which is really amazing i see someone is working on a gene technologies which i never imagined that you know will happen from indian uh, uh, land i mean that kind of a technological advancements and skills and knowledge what our indian students are displaying and they are not looking only to become a job seekers they are looking towards a job creators and i thank github for uh, giving this kind of opportunities to all our students and if you have any questions or concerns as i already mentioned the national education policy is open we are ready to accept any change which is betterment for our country and we are so happy to be part of uh, you know various other organizations we started working with other organizations trying to understand their requirements you know we are giving our interns to them and they all are working for various organizations and giving creating a capacity building not only for mnc's we are creating capacity building for government organizations also thank you so much i can't i don't have words to uh, actually thank you enough for for your kind words and i think it's it's great honor for us to receive first hand feedback from you not only as a user of github but also when you see others in the education ecosystem using and benefiting out of out of github uh, all i can say is that we as github are really committed to india uh, we are we are honored to actually being involved in in most of the projects whether it is covin whether it is uh, the health id at nha uh, arogya setu and we really want to be involved in the student id project that you are leading sir uh, uh, all our support and everything will be uh, at your disposal thank you and i think we are just running uh, short of out of time uh, rohit i have my last question to you uh, and that's going to be very very interesting for all the students uh, what are the top skills that you see in demand from a job perspective uh, of course uh, cloud cloud has be suddenly become very big uh, lot of job opportunities in cloud uh, artificial intelligence machine learning uh, i'm just saying some some of the skills that are top of my mind devops that's where the jobs are happening data science including data analytics uh, uh, data visualization cyber security again non tech ui ux in a in a broader way, um, sense mobile app development and so on and so forth either some of the uh, skills or 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 sectors or or, or technologies wherein there are lot of job opportunity that have come up especially in in last 6 months 12 6 to 12 months or so and i think i think this will continue to to remain these trends will continue to remain for maybe next 12 to 24 months all right i think we'll have to wrap up here i 
want to thank all of you, uh, Dr. Buddha, Amit, Rohit. Uh, really, thank you. I'm sure the participants have learned a lot in in our discussion. And uh, uh, my suggestion to all the participants will be to engage with our panelists on the social media. I know all of them are very active. Uh, so whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter, on on their behalf, I'm inviting you to uh, engage with them. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I will give back to the host now.